this is a lesson about complex numbers. What are they and how can we use them? Before we dive into that, let's just start off with a simple example. x squared equals 25. How do we solve this equation? Well, we know solving an equation means isolating x, right? So we need to get rid of that squared. In order to do that, we need to take the square root of both sides. So x just equals 5, correct? Careful. Remember, whenever we take the square root of both sides, we have to consider the positive and the negative case, right? Because negative 5 squared also equals 25. So these are the two solutions to this problem, positive and negative 5, right? Okay, pretty straightforward. Now let's check out this problem. Let's try to solve it in the same way. Well, first of all, we need to move that 9 to the other side, so x squared equals negative 9. Now to solve this, we need to, again, take the square root of both sides to try to isolate that x. So x equals the square root of negative 9. And in fact, uh, because we're square rooting both sides, we also have to consider the positive and negative case. So this is usually where we'd stop. We'd say there are no solutions to this problem because nothing times itself is going to give us negative 9. The square root of negative 9 doesn't exist. If you try it on most calculators, it's going to say error, right, if you try to do the square root of negative 9. But that's not the whole story. There actually is a way to find a solution to this problem. We're going to start off by simplifying that thing underneath the radical. So we can actually represent negative 9 as negative 1 times 9, correct? So let's just replace that under the radical. Um, we're basically just removing that negative from the 9 and making it negative 1. And then we can actually remove that 9 from underneath that square root, right? Because the square root of 9 is just 3. So it's like saying plus or minus 3 times the square root of negative 1. And again, you might say, oh, we can't take the square root of negative 1. If you try that in your calculator, you're going to get an error, right? And the key here is that there are no real solutions to this problem. But just because there's no real solutions doesn't mean there's no solutions. A little trick that some very smart mathematicians came up with is they decided to just give the square root of negative 1, this thing, a name. They said, let's just call that piece, let's call that i. Why i? Well, because these things were sort of like a little bit out there, a little bit strange, they called it i for imaginary. They were called imaginary numbers. And in fact, the first mathematicians that proposed this were seen as a little bit crazy and off the rocker because they're like, well, it's not a real number. So they sort of used imaginary as a bit of a derogatory name for these things. But it sort of stuck, so we're stuck with the I for imaginary. So really, the solution to this problem, we would say, is x equals plus or minus 3i where i, remember, just stands for the square root of negative 1. So really, if we were to write out both solutions here, x is equal to positive 3i and negative 3i. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, we haven't really changed anything here. All we've done is call the square root of negative 1i. We haven't gotten rid of that negative 1. There's still no real solutions. But the fact is, these solutions, 3i and negative 3i, are solutions even though they're not real solutions. They're solutions to the problem. And even though they're called imaginary solutions, they do have some practical applications in physics and finance, and there are places that they do pop up and become useful. So just to take a step back and look at our definitions, um, imaginary numbers are defined as numbers that contain this i, and remember i just stands for the square root of negative 1. If we square both sides of that, so we do i squared and we square the square root of negative 1, we get i squared equals negative 1, which is a bit strange to think about. It's like you square something and it gives you a negative number. We're always sort of told that if you square something, it always makes it positive. Well, i is the exception here. When you square i, you get negative 1. So again, this leads to all sorts of useful algebra that can sort of, we can sort of solve problems that we wouldn't be able to otherwise solve. Now the other ter uh, term, and the name of this lesson, is complex numbers. And all a complex number is, it's a number that has an imaginary part, so it's got an i in it, but it's also got numbers in it. So for example, 
3i plus 4. The 3i part here, we would call this the imaginary part of that number, and we would call the 4, this is the real part of that number. So we have sort of a combination of real numbers and imaginary numbers, that's called a complex number. So let's see how some of that algebra works with our values, with our i, with our imaginary numbers. So taking a look at the, this first one, 6i minus 2 minus the square root of negative 9. Well, as we already saw, we can't really simplify this first part, 6i minus 2, but, and minus, negative 9, uh, the square root of negative 9 can be written sort of as, I'm just going to do this off to the side, the square root of negative 1 times 9, right? And that square root of negative 1 is just going to call, be called i. So you can probably figure out that 3 is going to come out and that negative 1 is going to come out and you're going to get 3i. So this simplifies to that. And then we have 6 i's minus 3 i's, so we're going to left, be left with 3i minus 2. And there's our solution to that problem. Right? So this is a complex number because it contains both a real part and an imaginary part. Okay, moving on. 2i times 3i minus 1. Well, when we multiply terms like this, we can multiply the numbers. So 6, 2 times 3 is just going to be 6. And what's i times i? Well, if you look at our definition above, i squared is just going to be negative 1 minus 1. So we get negative 6 minus 1, which is negative 7. So in this case, we started off with a complex number, but it actually simplified to a real number. Continuing on, we have i times negative 3 to i times the square root of negative 4. So i times negative 3i, remember the i times i is just going to be negative 1. So it's like saying negative 1 times negative 3, which is going to be 3. Oops. Oops. Let's try that again. 3 um, times the square root of negative 4. And if you're catching on with the pattern here, negative 4, the square root of negative 4, is just going to be the square root of 4 with an i beside it. So it's going to be like 3 times 2i because the 4 comes out as a 2 and the negative comes out as an i. So we just end up with 6i. So an imaginary number for that answer. And lastly, d. So d, another one we can just simplify here. So let's start off with the numerator, negative 2 minus the square root of negative 200 well, we can just pull that negative out as an i, right? And then we're left with the square root of 200. Can we simplify what's under that square root anymore? And yeah, we can, right? We can pull a 100. 200 is 100 times 2, right? So we can pull the 100 out as a 10. So basically, we're going to be left with 10i root 2 over 4. And we can actually further simplify this because now we have a fraction that we can reduce, right? The 4 on the bottom, we can basically divide everything by 2. So we end up with negative 1 minus 5i root 2 over 2. And there is our final simplified solution to this problem. So again, it's a complex number because it has a real part and an imaginary part. Um, but it is the simplified version of this. So let's try to solve this next problem. This is actually an equation that we need to solve now. And note the instructions. Solve the following equation where x, e, c. And what that means is x is an element of complex numbers. We're used to solving equations as x is an element of real numbers, that fancy r, right? Instead, we're actually solving it um, overall complex numbers. So let's see what that looks like for this problem. This is a quadratic. Can we factor this quadratic, first of all? Two numbers that multiply to give us 10, add to give us 2? Don't think so, right? No numbers are going to are gonna do that. So the second step would be to plug it into the quadratic formula, or check the discriminant maybe, right? And if you even check the discriminant here, you'd actually see that there's no solution. So this thing is going to be a, a parabola that's somewhere, I don't know, something like this. It's up here above the x-axis. It never actually crosses the line. Um, y equals 0. 
But let's try plugging it into the quadratic formula anyways and see what happens. So if we do that, um, x is going to be negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 2 squared minus 4 times 1 times 10 all over 2 times 1, right? That would be it. So we can simplify 2 plus or minus, and the thing under the square root simplifies to negative 36 over 2. And this is the point where if we were solving this as a regular equation, we'd say no real solutions. Because the thing underneath the square root has a negative, and we know when that's the case, there's going to be no real solutions. But now we know we can do a little trick that enables us to solve for not the real solutions, but the complex solutions, right? So we can pull out that negative of that, we can pull that negative out from under that radical as an i, right? And this, in this case, is going to be plus minus, the square root of 36 is 6, the square root of negative 1 is i, so it's just going to get pulled out as 6i over 2. And then we can simplify that a little bit more. Um, if we divide everything by 2, we just get negative 1 plus or minus 3i. So our two solutions essentially are x equals negative 1 plus 3i and negative 1 minus 3i. So even though there is no graphical representation on the real plane of where it intersects the x-axis, it actually intersects this other plane, the complex plane. We're not going to get into graphing that in this course because it gets really complicated. And actually, to, to plot the, uh, the re, uh, complex plane, you actually need a four-dimensional graph, which obviously isn't that easy to do because we live in a three-dimensional world. But either way, these are the complex solutions to that equation. So it does have solutions. They are complex solutions. Um, but they do exist. So it does, it does have two solutions. The word imaginary isn't a great word because it, it sort of makes us think that they're not actual things. But in fact, they are. And we do see that. I'm not going to go through any examples of how they're applied um, here. But as I mentioned before, there are plenty of examples where these solutions can actually be used for calculations in real world applications. Anyways, moving on. Next question. We have a another polynomial here that we're asked to solve. So I want you to pause the video here, try this question yourself, and see if you can come up with any real or complex solutions to this problem. So hopefully you actually tried it yourself. Um, if we, so the first thing I did, by the way, is I factored out a negative sign out of this bracket because it just makes it easier to deal with. So I factored that out, just put it out in front. Um, when you do that, you see that there's this x out in front. So one solution to this problem that's going to make this whole thing equal to zero is obviously zero. If we plug in x is zero. So that's a solution, x is zero. Now, if I use the quadratic formula on this, it actually gives me two other solutions here. These are complex solutions, right? Because they have an i in there. We had a square root of negative 19. Um, when we simplify it, we can't really simplify that square root of 19 anymore. So the answer doesn't look that pretty, right? But it's, it's the solution. So if we listed all our solutions, the answers are x equals 0, negative 1 plus i root 19 over 2, and negative 1 minus i root 19 over 2. So this equation has actually three solutions. One of them is real, two of them are complex solutions, but it does have three solutions. Moving on to the next question. This question is luckily already factored for us. We can't really factor it anymore, right? Um, so to find solutions, we just need to look at how the, each of the factors can be equal to zero, right? So from this solution, obviously the thing that's going to make that zero is if x equals 2. From this uh, factor, the thing that's going to make it zero is x equals negative 3. And this part over here well, what's going to make that equal to zero? I'm just going to write this out as an equation, plus one equals zero, right? So we need to solve for where x is going to make that, what the value of x that's going to make that equal to zero. So we can do the same thing as we did up at the top of the page on the front page. Um, x squared equals negative one, 
right? And then we take the square root of both sides. So basically x is equal to plus or minus root of negative one. Now we know the square root of negative one is just i. So the answer here is that x is equal to plus or minus i, right? So our solutions of this problem, if we list them all out at the end, are negative three, two, i, and negative i. There are four solutions to this problem. You might be realizing a trend here. What degree is this polynomial? Well, how many x's are there multiplied? We have 1x, 2x, 3x, 4x, right? So this is a fourth order polynomial. Notice how many solutions are there? There's actually four solutions. If we look at the previous two examples, a, had, a was a quadratic and it had two solutions. B was a cubic and it had three solutions. C was a quartic and it had four solutions. So there's a bit of a pattern here where the number of solutions that a polynomial has is always equal to the degree. Some of those might be real, some of those might be um, complex, but it will always have that number of solutions. Sort of interesting. The last question here doesn't actually look like an equation. That's a mistake. This whole thing should just be equals zero. So what I want you to do now, pause the video, try this question yourself. You actually don't need to use factor theorem or any fancy grade 12 factoring to solve this. That's your little hint. You can solve it um, entirely using other stuff. So see if you can do it. Find all the solutions to this problem. So hopefully you tried it yourself. You can actually factor this just by grouping. Um, I factored out the y first. You can actually factor out a three y at the beginning. I actually missed that. Um, and then you can factor it by grouping. And the solutions you should get are that y equals zero, y equals two, and then this one is a complex solution or two complex solutions, plus or minus i root three. So I just list out your answers all at the end just to make it nice and clear. Zero, two, i root 3 and negative i root 3. There are the solutions to this problem. Again, as we just said with that pattern, there are four solutions to this, which makes sense because it is a quartic function. There we go. That's your introduction to imaginary and complex numbers.